well, it's been five years since groundbreaking and there's no water, but that there's also a lot of furrows, um, tillage in this area that we expected to have as a, a water habitat. And the reason those are there is that breaks up the wind, that breaks up the emission of fine PM 2.5 and PM 10 dust that can harm people and animals. But if they're putting in tillage, do they intend to not have wetlands be there? And that's, that's a major concern uh, for the wildlife at the Salton Sea. So let's keep that in mind as we go through the rest of the presentation. Um, we do want to turn it over to our board president, Tom Sefton, uh, who understands very, very well um, how salt works at the Salton Sea and how these water systems should be working. Um, Tom, are you ready to hop on? Sure, um, I'm ready. Awesome. You hearing me? Yes, yeah. can hear you great, Tom. Excellent. Thank you. Good. So, Let me know uh, you'd like the picture shared. Yeah, Carrie, if you'd bring up um, the uh, slide of the uh, 2018 um, CEQA uh, plan from uh, IID. You got it. And we could hop back into some more aerials a little bit later. Is this That's looking it. good to and, you? Yeah, that's it. Good. Fantastic. So this is a is an overview, and I think you can kind of recognize this from the uh, the satellite view that Carrie showed you. Um, except, and 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 the berms uh, that are indicated here were built. So uh, this is in the environmental document uh, that was uh, submitted in 2018 for the Red Hill Bay project. Uh, you heard that there was a groundbreaking in 2015, and here's a, a design in 2018. So this is a redesign. The original uh, concept of the Red Hill Bay project was a little bit simpler. Uh, they were going to bring in water from the Alamo River, which is what you see on the right, uh, that, that, that uh, dark band going out to the Salton Sea is the largest river that drains into the Salton Sea, uh, carries about uh, a little over um, 400,000 acre feet per year of water to the Salton Sea, so the, the, lar the um, major supply. And the idea was in the right corner of the uh, light brown area to uh, bring water from the Alamo River into, into the corner and then spread it across and then let it flow down and then pump water up from the sea. Um, and that, that was the original plan back in 2015. Uh, this plan that you see in front of you is the same concept, but a little bit more complex. It's, it's separating it into a couple of different ponds. Um, in the top middle, you see a pond with minus 228. That would be the elevation of that pond. And then next to it, you see a bigger pond with some arrows going out to it with an elevation of minus 230. Again, the elevation of that larger pond, uh, which would be um, several feet lower than the small pond. Um, you can see that on the right is an inflow uh, plan from the Alamo River uh, that goes through some sedimentation basins, which I'll go into why that's needed. Uh, and then it goes into a, a mixing station. And then you can, if you look out into the blue area on the upper left is a, a, a pumping barge uh, that's a kind of a jack up barge that um, Jasmine mentioned that would pump water in from the sea to that mixing station where it combines with the river water and then uh, flows out and flows together. At the bottom of the diagram, you can see uh, kind of an expanded view of what that jack up pumping barge would be like. Uh, so in this 2018 redesign, uh, you see a, a barge which would pump water up from the bottom of the sea and then in a pipe up onto the shoreline and uh, definitely in, in a, few, a couple of thousand feet into the mixing station. Uh, the vertical on this is exaggerated. The actual uh, slope of the bottom of the sea is actually extremely shallow. Uh, you can see in this that the, the distance in, in the actual drop of the sea uh, from the pumping barge up the land is uh, only about 10 feet. Uh, so it looks bigger in this case because it's an expanded view. Uh, you can go to the um, uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll just say a little bit more about this. At minus 230 feet, that's, that's the larger pond, the minus 228 smaller pond, they have a similar function. Both, both of those are habitat ponds uh, to support uh, fish and, uh, and fish-eating birds, and they're mostly quite shallow, 
the great majority of that is between one and three feet in depth. Uh, so it's designed for wading birds mostly. Um, and some of them are, are fish eating wading birds. You, you have uh, great blue heron and egrets, uh, which uh, love to uh, wade in the water and, and catch fish. And additionally, um, even pelicans, although some of them like to dive, they also have a surface mode of feeding that would work just fine on this uh, water body, both the white pelicans and the brown pelicans, we've seen surface feeding at the sea. Uh, so it, it would be supportive of them too. Even, and they're, even though it doesn't support their diving behavior, it does support their surface feeding behavior. And it'll support a wide variety of small shorebirds and, and, and various uh, waterfowl. Uh, so it, it would be a rich area. This, this area that you see used to be, um, if you go, when I first came to start work at the Salton Sea back in 2004, this entire area was flooded with water and, and actively used by fish and birds. What, so kind of, was, what kind of birds and fish were there at that time? And, and what do you time, think could benefit from a flooded uh, restor restoration project? Well, at, at, at that time, we had mostly um, Mozambique tilapia uh, would be the dominant fish. But there were also, um, in fact, I, I, <laughs> I won't show a video, but I have a, a Biardella that I picked up from the middle of that spot <laughs> uh, right as soon, uh, just a, about a year after it dried up. So there, there were also um, uh, Biardella, uh, Croker, Sargo, um, and, and uh, Corvina in the sea, uh, wow. although they, they kind of declined um, at about that time frame. Uh, and, but the dominant was the tilapia. And then there were some desert pupfish, although they're smaller and would mostly take refuge in shallow water and drains uh, when they had the big uh, uh, carnivorous fish out after them. Uh, I think they're now expanding their territory out into the sea from what we've seen. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. Sure. And this is a schematic of the same concept. Uh, so you see the Salton Sea, which is now about 70,000 milligrams per liter, which is about 70 grams per liter of salt uh, concentration. And for a point of reference, that is almost exactly double the salt concentration of the Pacific Ocean. And it is rising steadily. Uh, so that's, that's uh, getting to be a hypersaline body of water. Uh, the concept, and then in the, in the middle, you see the two ponds indicated in the diagram. And the, uh, the, the CEQA, uh, which is California Environmental Quality Act document, uh, which is the redesign done by IID in 2018, plans this big pond and this smaller pond and to design to keep both of them at about uh, 25 grams per liter to 40 grams per liter uh, total dissolved solids. Uh, and they would accomplish that at, as, as you see, that's, that's half of the current salt and sea salinity. So what they'll do to accomplish that salinity target is they will blend Alamo River water, uh, which has a, a salinity of about four grams per liter total dissolved solids with salt and seawater at 70 grams per liter. Uh, so you would have a mix and the planned mix would be uh, about 75% Alamo River water and about 25% salt and seawater. Uh, although that mix would have to change over time because the salt and sea is getting increasingly more salty. So they're gonna have to decrease the amount of salt they pull from the salt and sea to hit a salinity target. Uh, you can see that uh, the pump barge indicated, so it, it would pump water in from the Salton Sea to that mixing basin. And then uh, the, the flow from the Alamo River is a gravity inflow into three sedimentation basins. The reason you need that is if you look at the Alamo River, it's loaded with sediment, it's brown water. So you have to bring it into three successive ponds uh, and give it some time for the silt to drop out of the water and then uh, once you've got three successive dropout uh, processes, then you pump it into the mixing basin. And uh, so 75% water supply from sedimented out Alamo River water, 25% to start of salt and sea water. You mix and you outflow into both of the two ponds. Pond one kinds of flows around in a circle. And then uh, this is moving around a bit. Sorry. Uh, all right, thanks. And, uh, and then there's an outflow um, from the larger, the pond one has an outflow to the Salton Sea. So that, that's the essence of it. And the 
and that's how you maintain salinity by mixing the right quantity of Alamo River water and salt and seawater. Now the challenge is that the Alamo River is high in, um, is, is quite high at times in selenium. And if you've heard about things like the, uh, the, the Kesterson Reservoir in Central California where they had uh, various uh, avian deformities like uh, two-headed ducks uh, and other unfortunate things due to high selenium uh, in that water source, there's a challenge here too. The Salton Sea is relatively low in selenium. It's about two parts per billion selenium. The Alamo River can uh, get up to as high as seven parts per billion. The, the old EPA target for uh, aquatic habitat was less than five parts per billion. And the new EPA targets for ponds are on the order of three parts per billion. Uh, so you can see that if most of your water is coming from the Alamo River source, it can be anywhere from four to seven parts per billion uh, selenium. And you're trying to blend that down with only 25% of salt and seawater, you're gonna have a bit of a problem. And as the salt and seawater blend drops because of the rising salinity, you have even less and less lower selenium water to blend and you have an increasing problem. Uh, so if you actually calculate out the, uh, the hydrology and the, and, the, and the balance of selenium, if you balance for salinity and you try to balance for selenium at the same time, during the summer when there's a lot of evaporation off of the surface, uh, you will actually have some uh, an ongoing problem where in the summers you're above that EPA target for selenium content and you have to start worrying uh, about selenium buildup. Now one of the reasons that they are going for a saline environment instead of just a brackish, you know, you could say well it's just bringing water from the Alamo River. One problem of course is selenium. Uh, the idea there though is also selenium buildup in the environment because if you've got a, a pond that's full of reeds, those reeds will take up selenium. And then the birds, certain types of birds that, that, that eat plants and the, the whole um, ecosystem where you have uh, fish and other organisms that's, that are eating those reeds will build up selenium in their body tissues. And then the birds will eat those and get an even higher charge of selenium. So the reason they wanna target this water at being roughly a marine salinity is so that reeds don't grow there. Um, and that's a good idea um, because if, if this were full of reeds and this water source had high selenium, which it does in the Alamo River, you would have a problem. The challenge is uh, reeds are not the only thing that take up selenium. Algae also take up selenium and they do grow in marine water. So there is going to be a challenge with uh, selenium in, in the water column itself and, and uptake by algae that's then eaten by fish, which are then eaten by birds building up selenium in, in, in the wildlife. So some measures are gonna to have to be taken uh, to uh, address that. My suggestion for that is to have a third source of water that's very low in selenium, uh, which could either be Colorado River water, which has a much lower selenium because it's not draining selenium out of fields like the Alamo River water is. Or if Colorado River water is not available, you can also desalinate or partially desalinate the salt and sea water or the habitat water, and that process will take the selenium out and also help you manage your salinity. Uh, so that's not an official proposal. I, I did present it to the state. Uh, they're not listening yet, but they will in a few years when they have a problem. Uh, I'll uh, let, uh, let it go to the next speaker, unless there are questions. So we're at a point, thank you so much, Tom, uh, that, that gave us a lot of very detailed information. And we understand that there's some challenges with this body of water no matter how we look at it. But I don't believe all of these challenges and the reason, the reasons that there is no wetland there today have been validated. There should be wetlands there today. There's been a lot of money spent on this. There's been a lot of promises made by the organizations and the agencies that we trust to do the right thing, that we trust to make the habitat that they promised they would. Um, so I'd like to discuss a little bit more about what are some of the holdups to today? Um, Eric, are we able to go over a little bit more of the, uh, the drone footage so people can see what it looks like these days? So we had a correspondent actually head out to Red Hill Marina today. Her name is Velma Pekram, and uh, you may see her, 
her journalism online. She covers the whole Salt and Sea area very, very well. And she said she didn't see anyone working on it today. She did take some video clips. It looks like what you see. No water. Uh, there were no construction crews there. So I'd like to do one more go over of the simple who's involved, who's done their part, who hasn't done their part, and then what can we do about it. So, uh, Tom, what agencies are involved specifically in the construction of this project? Okay, so the agencies directly involved in the construction are the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, um, which, had, which uh, originally proposed the project, uh, the director of the Sonny Bono Salton Sea National Wildlife Refuge, who originally conceived of this project and promoted it and proposed it. His name is uh, Chris Schoneman. And uh, he, he pushed this forward uh, starting uh, back uh, in tw before 2014 and, uh, and, and, and took it through uh, a process of uh, getting uh, grant funding. In fact, uh, they are well before 2014, he, he proposed this project to the Salton Sea Financial Assistance Program, uh, which took grant proposals in late 2012. And his was one of uh, about 10 or so grant proposals. And it was the highest rated proposal in, the, uh, in, in, that, in that program. And for good reason, it was a well-designed project uh, by Chris Schoenemann. And uh, it, it got a grant of a little over a million dollars from the state. Uh, to start work on Who's the project. The state in this this case, who is the state? The state would the state is the state of California, and uh, the the Natural Resources Agency, uh, combined with the, the the California at that time called the Department of of um, well, it's now called the, the uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, and it used to be um, the Fish and Game Department. Uh, so they. Um, they uh, analyzed grant proposals and, and awarded the Red Hill Bay project, uh, I believe it was 1.1 million in grant funding to move the project forward. Uh, they took that money and uh, did the environmental analysis uh, to re required to push through the project. They worked with local agencies to get uh, permits and approvals mm -hmm. to do earthworks and to get approvals to bring water back in at that time, back in 2012, uh, the, the Red Hill Bay had just very recently dried up uh, and it, it was still a little damp, but it was, it, it had lost most of its water at that time. Um, so they, they, and they knew it would lose everything uh, in short order. Uh, so they started working on it, uh, got money from the state and uh, the, the ownership of the, of the project is such that the, the land that the Red Hill Bay is on is owned by the Imperial Irrigation District. And the United States Fish and Wildlife Service has a very long-term lease, I think it's a 99-year lease, on that land to support the, uh, a, the Sonny Bono National uh, Wildlife Refuge. And so this has been land on a long-term lease to the federal government by IID for a very long time. Uh, used to be shallow water habitat when it was full of salt and seawater, then dried, dried up. And as it was starting to dry up, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service put this forward uh, because the Imperial Irrigation District, IID for short, is the landowner. They also have to be very much involved in the project because they have to approve what happens on their land. Um, so U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service worked with the Imperial Irrigation District uh, with state money to uh, to move the project forward to get the, get uh, the very long and complicated environmental uh, analysis process done to get some of the per permitting process moving uh, to get us a, a start on on some of the layout and figuring out how to do it um, in uh, 20 uh, in, in October 2015 and and that that was done let me say that was uh, the Imperial Irrigation District Management at that time was under Bruce Wilcox, who was uh, leading the, uh, the Imperial Irrigation District Salton Sea Program at the time. Uh, in late 2015, he went to uh, take a position with the State National Resources Agency 
and uh, other people at the Imperial Irrigation District took charge of the project. Um, and they took the project in a different direction and they decided to redesign the project. And that's, and the, the, the outcome of that redesign is, is the, the design that you saw me show a little while earlier, which uh, is, is a little more complex in the earthworks than the original plan. It's more complex in uh, how they pump water from the sea. Uh, the this US Fish and Wildlife uh, idea was to, to dig a di long ditch out in the sea and, and bring the water in that way and then pump it up close to shore and keep extending that ditch and deepening the ditch as the sea recedes. Uh, the plan put forward by the new management at IID uh, decided to, uh, to, to put a barge out in the sea, which could be moved. It has a logic to it and could be jacked up so it wouldn't be impacted by wave action and then would pump water in through a long uh, 20 inch uh, to down to 16 inch pipeline in. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a sensible concept, but it adds to the money. Um, and also they decided to do more of a pump in scheme with sedimentation basins and that mixing scheme uh, of Alamo River water in a little bit more dynamic way where you have two pipes flowing at each other at high speed and the water flat blasts together from opposite sides and sprays out into the mixing station in a very turbulent way and then flows out into the ponds. Uh, so the, it, it, it was a reasonable plan. Unfortunately, it added over a million dollars to the cost of the project and they didn't have the extra million needed. Um, so originally you had a million, about 1.1 million from the state and a matching amount uh, that was put up by the federal government. Uh, but instead of 2 million, you then you needed three, over 3 million to complete the project. And that has been a stumbling point since uh, 2018 when the cost of the project accelerated, uh, raised and the money was not there to uh, complete it. Why, why do you think we're seeing all of these furrows, all, all of these trenches? So the furrows is the IID's plan. They're, that's their primary plan for the future of the Salton Sea. Uh, the, their plan is essentially to let the sea um, dry down to uh, possibly two thirds to a half of its current size and then use these uh, furrows uh, to reduce the wind speed at the surface of the ground. Uh, and the concept there is that as, as the wind goes over those furrows, it will drop some of the sand that it's carrying and some of the dust that it's carrying down into the furrows and less of it will be carried across the surface. And particularly with sand, if you reduce the amount of sand that's blowing across, uh, if the sand goes further on, it'll break up the fine sediment that's on the on the the dry lake bed. Most of the Salton Sea has a very fine sediment bottom, and then other areas have sand. And if sand hits that dry sediment crust, it will break it free, and you'll get very fine particle dust called PM10 dust, meaning uh, dust <coughs> particles less than 10 microns. And they do things like what Kerry was just showing you. They they it it exacerbates asthma very dramatically. It, it exacerbates conditions like bronchitis and emphysema, and it actually causes lung cancer. So it, it is a serious problem if it starts getting into the lungs of the people that live and work around this area. So IID's plan is to let the, let the sea dry down because they're selling a lot of that water to San Diego and Palm Springs and, and the Los Angeles area and then to put these furrows in to reduce the amount of dust that's blowing off of that surface. Um, so you, you see they're implementing that plan uh, in, in the, to the extent that they can with funding that they have under something called the Quantification Settlement Agreement Joint Powers Authority, wherein the water districts were uh, required to put in 133 million back in uh, 2003 uh, and, and put that money in over a period of time to, to pay for projects like uh, digging these furrows. And it also paid for, uh, most of it in fact, paid for keeping some additional water in the sea um, to slow down a bit the, the rate of salinity rise during the first 15 years after 2003. But it was assumed back in 2003 that by 
50, 15 years later, the state would have a restoration plan for the sea. And it was in legislation that that should happen. Unfortunately, this, the legislation did not require the state to actually pay for the restoration plan. And unfortunately also at the time the state came out with their restoration plan in 2007, you might remember that there was a very serious recession based on a housing crisis that hit at us at that time. And suddenly the state was completely unable to play, pay for their plan. And uh, we're still challenged with that. So what the state is doing now is essentially the, um, the no project alternative <laughs> envisioned in their 2007 plan, which envisioned paying as much as a billion dollars to do mitigation around the edges of the sea, to mitigate the dust blowing off and to mitigate the loss of habitat by creating new habitat on the shoreline and on the playa. So I'm seeing a couple parallels here that concern me. Uh, the biggest concern, first off, is that this, these furrowing, this tillage provides very, very little habitat. Um, there could be perhaps a happy lizard in there. If some trees do grow or if they're able to get some things to grow with the water that they don't have, um, there might be some bushes that a, a, a lucky bird would find a solitary nest in, but this isn't something known for habitat value. And after so much of it being wiped off, we're heavily, heavily concerned. Um, years ago, the Salton Sea was known to have had 424 species of birds. Um, that's massive. So there are birds that fly from the tip of South America all the way up to Alaska. Some get onto the Russian Peninsula all across the U.S. And the Salton Sea is one of their last habitats. Uh, California has accidentally destroyed close to 95% of the wetlands in the state. So in the spiking of the salinity at the Salton Sea and in the mismanagement of the habitat that should be created now, we are wiping that out at an alarming rate. Um, so this is why we're putting so much focus on getting something to happen in these areas that have already been planned. I want to draw a quick parallel and then we're going to turn it over for questions. And then we do have a segment about what can we actually do. Uh, there are some solutions and it's about the people that are in charge that need to hear from you. And we have a few of those in mind. Um, so I'm going to share my screen one more time. And there's a place that our team has been to quite a few times uh, called Owens Lake in, in Central California. So uh, can, we, can we see the map on my screen? Yes. Yeah. All right, fantastic. So um, I'm going to zoom into Owens Lake in Central California. So close to 100 years ago, similarly to around the time that Salton Sea was uh, created. This was a large, lovely lake, about a third the size of Salton Sea. And there were happy towns around it, there was tourism, um, and it was a neat place. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, but in order to find a water source for Los Angeles, um, Metropolitan Water District at, at, at that, is that, was it Metropolitan then? Um, that, that was the uh, Los Angeles uh, 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 Department of Water and Water, Power. Department of Water and Power, it, and it, they they were they were the authority back in uh, the early um, <laughs> early in the last century that uh, that uh, conceived of this. This this was the brainchild of of the famous Mr. Mulholland. So what it did do was provide water for one of our biggest cities. That's a great thing. Um, but what has been happening over the century is just the the gradual drying out of the interior of the United States. Uh, we're pulling all of the water out. Um, the only water left to feed the Southwest in a grand enough water is the Colorado River. There are some other well sources aside from the ocean. We haven't been tapping on the ocean like all of the other places in the world that have the same climate like in the Middle East, which is why we have also in many cases and in scenarios advocated for certain desalination. But in the parallel to Owens Lake, we're seeing the same thing happen at the Salton Sea. And this lake was about a third the size of Salton Sea and it was creating the worst dust storms in North America. Uh, it was wiping out people in the valley. People were getting very sick. They'd have to evacuate the valley. Um, these towns were going under. So it was mandated by lawsuit that um, LA Department of Water and Power work with a few other different agencies and keep the dust down here. And we've been up to this location many times on our trips to Sacramento and in the last 15 years, they've spent about $3 billion um, 
doing this to keep the dust down. And there is some habitat value, but much of it has been tillage. Uh, much of it has been blowing up the mountains nearby to cover gravel all over it. And as you can see, there's not a lake here anymore. Um, the habitat value is, has been shuttered. And they've spent close to $3 billion pouring fresh water back into it so it doesn't blow around again. And then there was good rain one year. Much of that got flooded and they had to redesign much of it again. So we're seeing a lot of these mistakes being repeated at the Salton Sea. And there are some fantastic companies that did good work at Owens Lake um, to keep the dust down. But we have so many more options for restoration that we haven't learned from our history here. So we want to ensure that we create and maintain sustainable wetlands. Um, so I would like to turn it over with some more aerial footage, please, Eric, um, to Jasmine in just a moment. Um, but we do have a couple questions. So let's see, we have one clear question. So, okay, someone said this was a, a local photographer who we've worked with. When a third to half the Salton Sea goes away, that's going to be miles and miles of furrows. You're correct. Um, that is potentially tens of thousands of acres of habitatless, reasonably dusty dirt that creates dirt when they make it and then they have to do it again. Correct. Uh, do we know what plants are in the furrows? Is that one, Jasmine? Do you know what couldn't grow there if they something can grow? Um, I, I think they... Go yeah, ahead. I think, Tom, I think Tom has the names. Yeah. Well, um, I, I don't have all the names because I'm not a botanist. I have walked the furrows quite a bit. And they're, they're, they're small, uh, herbaceous, uh, shrub-like uh, plants. There's some Allen Rolfia. Uh, there, there's there's, there's um, some uh, uh, salt bush, I think it's called. Uh, and and there's, there, as you can see in some of those aerial uh, videos, uh, what, what grows in those furrows without um, uh, con continuously watering them, irrigating them, is very little. Um, I've seen a couple of coyotes uh, crossing <laughs> the, the Red Hill Bay area, but I haven't seen any uh, life, actually, any, any animal actually living in those furrows, uh, having walked, walked it quite a bit. Um, so yeah, you, you get a very little bit of low uh, uh, plant life. Uh, you have to irrigate the furrows if you want extensive growth of, of plants, uh, which they're not doing in most of these areas because the concept here is waterless dust control uh, because the water is being sold. Okay, so we're, we're concerned that overall that this won't get built, that there won't be water here for any animals and that we can potentially wipe out the Pacific Flyway. So we, we need to pressure those that are in the powers to make sure that these projects get completed to do so. I'm going to go over to a quick clip from one of our correspondents, Velma, who was there today. Uh, so Perry, this, Perry, this is Benjamin on the Fisher. I, I just had a quick question whenever, whenever you get a second. I apologize. Okay. Um, sure. I'll, 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 mute, I'll mute myself. I just had a quick question for you again. Okay. We'll turn it over in just a second. I, please do um, type me a question if you'd like to ask one. Oh, and then I'm I'll sorry. Be happy I've, to open I've it never up used for the you. chat. We'll just to Perry, keep it simple. Um, we shouldn't have people be able to be heard. I appreciate you, and we'll call on you in a second. But that's not working as we intended. So <laughs> I've never, I've never done this before, Carrie. So I have, I'll, I'll mute myself. Up. If you <laughs> look right. at the bottom, of, look on the bottom of your screen. You'll see a, a little icon that looks like a little, uh, you know, talk balloon, and that's the chat. Sure. So I'm going to do a, a quick show of what it looks like today on the ground. So we saw some recent aerials, and then. We have a couple questions, and then Jasmine um, is going to share some things that can be done, and we have some action items for you. So let's look at video from a couple hours ago of Red Hill uh, from our correspondent on the ground, Vilma Ruiz Pekram. So this groundbreaking was five years ago. Um, one of the main reasons we haven't seen action is because there isn't enough electricity yet to run the pumps, and we've seen some stalling. Um, by IID. They have done some good work here. Yes, they're keeping some dust down, but they haven't brought the power needed for the pumps. There's a few different reasons, but that's something that we would like to see happen to keep water there. So there's enough infrastructure in place. We should not let this project go, but just creating furrows is not going to save the day. So I'd like to turn it over to 
Jasmine, after two questions. Um, so, so what you're looking at right now is that mixing basin that we talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, so from the right would be the smaller pipe brings the water from the Salton Sea so from Oop. the left. Sorry, I don't awesome. know who that fellow is. <laughs> okay. Well, what you were looking at <laughs> from the left was the, the pipe that would bring the water from the Alamo River. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what all of this is. Uh, rock sculpture by the sea. Okay. We do like rock, scul rock sculpture. So we're going <laughs> to have a couple questions now um, from the audience. So a question from, from our audience was, well, I'll, I'll let him ask this. We may have a short answer for this. And then we have one other question by Chris as well. So let's, let's open up um, Benja Fisher again for your question. Um, All right, Benjamin, if you can go ahead with your question. So I'm clicking unmute for you. If you're able to see that go, cool. Thank you, Gary. I really appreciate it. And once again, sure. I apologize for what I missed. Thank you for your support uh, through the years. No problem. Yeah, no, I, I have a, I've, I've been going there for several years and the, uh, started about 12 years ago. Um, I actually named my band the North Shore Yacht Club and wrote some music, but uh, I'll send that to you sometime. <laughs> my, my question is, though, um, is anybody here or anybody else in contact with Controlled Thermal Resources, the company that's harvesting the lithium from the south of the sea to help manage the land? So that's a good question, I think, for Tom. What's the status on their involvement, whether it be us, whether it be the other agencies? Um, how is Controlled Thermal Resources and the geothermal companies? Is there a tie in here? Uh, we just have a couple minutes and a few more questions, so let's yeah, keep this one sweet. In the in the in in a way there is. So the the land uh, at the at Red Hill Bay is actually been under long term geothermal lease from Cal Energy Operating Co Company, uh, which is also also uh, known as uh, Berkshire Hathaway Energy. Um, so Red Hill Bay Geothermal Resource is owned by Cal Energy uh slash berkshire hathaway um and uh the controlled re thermal resources there have leased some uh a large amount of uh imperial irrigation district land immediately north of this red hill bay area uh, they are will be building their plant on what used to be mullet island and will be uh putting in uh their geothermal uh development um using both lithium and and power uh, in, in that Mullet Island area. And they have agreed to integrate uh, some aquatic habitat into their plan. So they will be creating and sustaining uh, some significant habitat ponds within their, their leasehold area. Okay. Sure, that's a good question. Um, I have one more short one uh, from someone who I know has presented a, a full salt and sea restoration solution. And he said, why don't you support my proposal to bring clean environment and prosperity to nearby communities? And we do. We support anyone who is putting forth well-educated projects that are going to do much better than furrowing. And I believe thoroughly that you know how to take care of the water. And there are people out here in, in the audience um, that have put together full-scale restoration solutions for the Salton Sea. And we love that because they have a vision. They're working on things that are worth believing in. Uh, a restored salt and sea, a region that comes back to life. And we do support you. And thank you so much for tuning in today. Um, this one is about Red Hill Bay specifically, so we're going to keep to that. Um, we have another question from uh, Mr. Uh, Cockcroft. Mention, mention to, if that's uh, Mr. Lakin, uh, yep. just mentioned that in January, we will be inviting him and all the other uh, proposers to to say their piece to the public on a session just like this. Correct. So we're going to have for the long term solutions, we're going to have 10 minutes for each presenter to share their grander vision of what can happen to the salt and sea. And we believe with you that it could be so much better than it is today. So please keep doing what you're doing. Um, Chris, we have a quick question from you. You've always been very active in the community. We really appreciate you. Um, Chris Cockroft, if you're ready, please. Go for I'm it. here. Can you hear me? Yeah. What, oh. what are you thinking today about Red Hill Bay, Chris? 
Oh, listen, um, I talked to Chris Jonaman, who is uh, the fish and wildlife uh, person at the Salton Sea uh, Wildlife Area. <clears throat> he told me that they got the grant for $3 million back in the day. They gave the money to IID to um, uh, do the project. What happened was they are only, the Fish and Wildlife Service only gives them an annual allocation. And IID apparently, uh, now he might correct me if I'm wrong, uh, IID said they want a long-term lease. And because the Fish and Wildlife, before they will finish the project. So the hang up is between the fact that there's only an annual appro appropriation for the Fish and Wildlife Service versus IID who's hanging them up with uh, the other thing of having a long of getting the money up front to do a long-term lease so i just want to say that and also yeah. i uh, i want to say on a more general scale the iid may seem like the big dinosaur in the area and the big fish in the pond as it were if there were any fish left but they are all underneath the state law and the state law is the duchenne legislation and the fish and game legislation that empowered restoration of the salton sea mm -hmm. back in 2003 so the imperial irrigation, no matter what they do, it always has to be underneath that law, meaning that the state law prevails in any cases on that subject. On another subject, I just want to say one other thing, if I may. Do you mind? Sure, Chris. Okay. We're wrapping up, so we'll keep it shorter, but we really appreciate you on today. Okay. I just want to say that I found that uh, uh, the state right now is like looking into doing their CEQA process for their dust, their 10 year plan and their dust habitat projects. Now I filed this, this form with them during the process for their 10 year plan comments about the fact that this, the Alamo and New Rivers put 5 million pounds of pesticides into the, into the water every year, especially spring and fall. So that's 50 million pounds in 10 years of pesticides, which are aquatic uh, killing pesticides. They have been, I have the documentation with that. And then also you saw the Ian James article about the dirt in the new, I mean, not dirt, fecal coliform bacteria and pesticides. That's another one on that subject. <clears throat> so there are many issues here at stake that the state is seemingly, um, what are they doing? I think, I don't really trust them. I think they're doing stuff that is not uh, above board. They've cut down on public commentary. And I think that, um, I'm working hard on that, so thanks. Sure, thank you so much for tuning in, Chris. And at this point, after seeing so many promises and so little action, there aren't many people that we do trust at the Salton Sea to do the right thing until they do it. That's the state, that's IID, that's all of these large agencies that have the funding to do something that don't. So we're encouraging and we wanna to provide tools and connections and resources for people to get involved and stay involved. But there are a lot of decisions that we have to make for ourselves on whether who you should trust. But please, whatever you do, just get involved. Um, and I, I do want to turn it over uh, to Jasmine because she's right on that topic. After one update, we have an insider at Imperial County uh, who shared an update with what is happening with Red Hill next. So Imperial County Air Pollution Control District is in the process of issuing a stipulated order for abatement to IID and the Fish and Wildlife Service for the implementation of the project. So this is still in the works. Um, both parties know that's going on, uh, but there will be a public hearing soon at a later date. And when we have that information, we will share it with you to chime in and do whatever you can to support restoration that's actually gonna move. So there's supposed to be some big steps from the Air Pollution Control District soon uh, to get action. Um, because historically, um, Imperial County and the Air Pollution Control District have some great plans for the Salton Sea. So does the state. So does IID. But they don't always work together quite as we'd like them to. So we need to be encouraging and help them find some common ground. But after all of this, Jasmine, um, what can we do? How can we get involved? How can we make a difference today? I know there's a few different people that we can speak to that we should speak to to make action move, but who do you think needs to hear from us first for one good step? I think first of all, we need to reach out to the people on the project. We can see a lot of the good work that the US Fish and Wildlife has done. But the issue that we're at right now is getting that um, industrial strength power out to the project so that it can pump water to flood the playa. So I believe that a really simple thing that we can do is simply reach out to the board members of the IID 
And to make it easy for everyone, we've created a letter template that you can find on our website, ecomediacompass.org. You can download the letter, uh, personalize it, and then send it to the board members. All the their information, their contact information is supplied right there. So that's a really simple first step that anybody can do. Another thing we can do is support the Sunny Bono Salton Sea National Wildlife Refuge. The trails are open, the park is open, the visitor center is closed right now, but, but get out there and you know, see what's going on. And if you feel inclined, make a donation. They're a hardworking crew out there. And what they do is really important, especially for the wildlife at the Salton Sea and for our enjoyment too. Thank you so much. So I do want to encourage you all uh, to write a letter. And we're not trying to point fingers in a hard way. We don't have to be mean, but we need to be supportive of action. We need to be supportive of the steps that are being taken. And for those that promise things that don't get them done, call them out. But they overall, they need our support. They need us to go to these meetings. They need to help the attention stay focused on restoration initiatives and not just mitigation. Exactly. The Plan letter, it, the letter is very, it just lets them know that we're concerned that we want to see restoration of the wetlands and we know they can help and we're asking their help. And we should also mention that at, uh, a couple of uh, IID board positions are up, up for re-election in uh, November 3rd. So this is a particularly good time to contact these folks and uh, let them know you're interested uh, because uh, particularly people who are within the IID service area and are allowed to vote for these directors uh, because um, they will be paying even more attention now <laughs> when there's election afoot. Yeah. Uh, and, and as Jasmine said, do visit Red Hill Bay. It's a, and the weather's cooling down a bit. It's a nice little half mile walk out to Rock Hill. Uh, and uh, you can climb up Rock Hill and get a beautiful panoramic view of the entire Salton Sea and the Imperial Valley. I recommend it. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, we had a couple great questions chime in today. We're so thankful that you showed up. We hope that you use some of these points of knowledge gained today uh, to create action in the community. And not only IID, not any one particular agency, but use some of these tools to show up to the meetings and advocate for the completion of Red Hill. Uh, we did have this event planned for one hour today. Um, so we're so thankful that you tuned in. I do want to let you all know that we are a volunteer run organization. Um, we need your support to keep doing these things. We would be so grateful. So you can go to ecomediacompass.org and donate if you'd like. Uh, there's a happy little donate button. It's tax deductible, but we do have some upcoming events. So uh, we've been doing these every month to support California Salt and Sea. Uh, next one is November 8th at 6 p.m. It's a little bit of a longer meeting. We will have more time for some questions. If you are interested in being a presenter or sharing on the panel with us, please do contact us. You can reach out on the website. We would love to hear from you and incorporate some of your thoughts and your experiences into um, some direction for restoration. And I do want to let you know, so November 8th is our next event. It's a photo tour and some Salt and Sea art. We do want to keep artists sharing the story. Telling the story of the Salton Sea takes it far beyond our, our local boundary lines. Um, November 14th, we have a film and interviews day in person. Uh, so part of our crew is going to be out there taking a tour of the Salton Sea. We'd like to stop by and meet with some of you and um, share your interviews and your stories uh, with the media. Um, December 13th, what's going on in Desert Shores? So as you know, we've been working on a project in Desert Shores. There's recently an MOU between the Natural Resources Agency and Imperial County to get that built, but the MOU doesn't have the teeth we're looking for. So we definitely need some support there to keep restoration moving. And then one that we're all really excited about is January 31st, as long as it's not on Super Bowl Sunday, we'll double check that, <laughs> is uh, a seawater import RFP proposal team. So we're gonna invite those that have been working on whole salt and sea solutions to prevent or to present their highest visions of what can help restore the salt and sea and then also some avenues um, for restoration there. Uh, do we have any other announcements that we'd like to have from our board today and our team that presented? Okay. Well, thank you all for joining us. 
Thank you all so much for joining us. We do like to have one little fun bit at the end. We're going to unmute everyone just for a second, and we like to say Save Our Sea. So this keeps the momentum up. Um, so I'm going to count to three. Um, if you're a co-host, please help unmute just for a second. And we'd love to have you say Save Our Sea with us. We are taking all of these materials that we're creating every month and putting them in resources on the website soon. So we're going to have a lot of great resources and action resources um, for you. Um, so on the count of three, we're going to say Save Our Sea, and then it will be until next time, friends. Thank you so much for tuning in. We are the Ecomedia Compass. This is California Salt and Sea. Ready? One, two, three. Save, Save Our Sea. Save Our Sea. Thank you. We appreciate you so much for tuning in. Keep in touch. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.